Hello and welcome to NDTV Profit. You're watching Bankable, the show where we talk to bankers across India, uh, try and find out what makes them tick and understand from them how exactly they're seeing the current business environment and what is coming up in the next few months. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, talking to uh, Mr. P. Vasudevan, the, uh, the MD and CEO of Equitas Small Finance Bank. Mr. Vasudevan, welcome uh, to Bankable. Uh, pleasure having you here in our Bombay studio. Uh, uh, Mr. Vasudevan, I, I want to start this conversation with the premise of, of Equita, small finance bank as an institution, right? So 2015, you get uh, the in-principle approval from the RBI. 16, you start your operations. Uh, what has that eight-year journey as a bank, or well, a small finance bank, how, how has that played out for you? Thank you, Ish, and nice to be part of this show. Um, you know, we started uh, Equita as an NBFC MFI in 2007. Hmm. And uh, there was a guideline from RBI for a differentiated banking license which came in 2014 and we applied for that. And <clears throat> RBI gave us the license in 2015 and we converted our NBOCs into a bank in 2016, September. So that's how the, <clears throat> the transition happened. So we are now about an eight year old bank <clears throat> in the system. And there's been a lot of, uh, you know, good amount of learning as a yeah. bank compared yeah. to an NBOC. Yeah. Um, you know, many people do ask me, why did we become a bank? <clears throat> what's the benefit or what's the advantage of becoming a bank? Why couldn't you have remained as an NBOC? Um, well, you know, the NBOC has a very high level of value creating capability in the short term. And uh, definitely NBOCs can do well for a pretty long period of time in terms of creating value for stakeholders. However, uh, if you want to create a sustainable, a long-term scalable value proposition, a banking format is something which is a lot more, lot more kind of, uh, you know, mm. uh, broad-based. Yeah. And that broad-based platform enables you to scale up over a long period of time to a different level. Uh, which typically, in my personal view, NBOCs may struggle to kind of uh, deliver that level of growth okay. over a longer period of time. Okay. So I think bank in a long time, fr long term framework, is something which is good for the institution, and that's why we really converted into a bank. Okay, and and these eight years, how has that uh, initial premise of you know delivering long term value, uh, how has that played out for you? So, um, you know, when we uh, did our uh, roadmap before we applied for the banking license, um, see, the objective of uh, converting into a bank is that our cost of funds should become lower than what a typical NBOC would have, and it should have closer, uh, you know, relation with what's the cost of funds of a bank. Mm. And once you reach that, then you are not really competing with NBOCs any longer. You are in a different uh, platform. Correct. And the benefit of converting into a bank truly comes into the system. So when we had sat down initially, we had penciled in a plan that in a 10-year time frame, uh, our cost of funds should come to a level yeah. which is uh, close to the large banks and much better than the best of the NBOCs, but closer to a large bank. So we had kind of put out a 10-year roadmap. Mm. Um, so now eight years we have completed. So when we convert into a bank, <clears throat> just before converting into a bank, our cost of funds as an NBOC was about 10.5%. Uh, when we convert into a bank, our landed cost of money, we, we cal as a bank, we calculate what we call as a landed cost of money, which is the interest cost that mm. we pay on deposits, plus the entire liability team, which we set up as a bank to mobilize deposits, the entire cost of the liability team, and there's a certain level of negative carry on our SLR, CRR investment, right. which we have to make as a bank. So if I add all the three components, that, that we call as a landed cost, and actually the cost of raising the money in the bank. That's what we call as landed cost. When we were an NBOC, it was 10.5%. The day we became a bank, that moved to 13%. Okay. <laughs> because my interest cost went down, but I suddenly uh, you know, had to take about 3,500 people to mobilize deposits. Yeah. As an NBOC, I had three people raising money from the banks. <laughs> three became 3,500 people. Sure. So, so that uh, 10 and a half became 13% when we became a bank. Uh, this year, that 13% has come down to 9% mm. uh, because of our interest rates also coming down, as well as the uh, efficiency of mobilization Correct. also going up. So because of all of that, that 13 has now become 9. Uh, what we believe is in a three year time frame that nine should ideally come to anywhere around seven, seven and a half percent. Okay. And in a five year time frame, that seven and a half percent should go down to anywhere around six and a half percent. And when that happens, which is our landed cost of money, right? 
the landed cost of money. When that happens, that's when we, we will actually cease to be a, a kind of an NBFC combined bank kind of a structure Correct. that we are today looking at to a real bank where our cost of funds is significantly better than the best NBOC and closer to the large banks. So in a 12 year time frame is what we think we can deliver that. I mean, 10, ten year becomes 12 year sure. largely because my feeling is that the two year corona period kind of uh, set us back. So more or less the 10 year plus the two year corona. So that's a transition or that's a trajectory that we are mm. looking at to get the benefit of uh, what we initially planned uh, as we okay. converted. Uh, you know, this uh, you mentioned corona. Uh, uh, I, I, I want to touch upon that a uh, little later on this conversation, but let me go back to before you were a bank, right? As an NBFC, you had multiple business units. You started off uh, with microfinance, but uh, eventually you entered other uh, spheres of lending as well. Um, what was the thought process of, uh, of getting out of, because I, I'm assuming when you uh, made this decision, that's when the microfinance cycle was at its peak and things were not looking so great for the sector. Um, but, but what was the uh, period like that at that point in time? How did you arrive at this decision that you maybe want to diversify your business a little bit? Yeah, so in 2007, we started a microfinance uh, NBOC. Mm. In 2010, we had that Andhra Pradesh yes. crisis in microfinance, and uh, that was almost a two-year impact on the industry. Mm. The microfinance industry at that time was about 25,000 crore, all, all, yeah, all India industry. Mm. Uh, in a one and a half to two year time frame during that uh, post that IP crisis, that 25,000 actually came down to 7,000 crores. So the microfinance industry shrank almost mm. by two thirds. Mm. And uh, we were an NBOC MFI and we were also shrinking because banks were not willing to lend. They know there's so much of confusion in the market, banks naturally take a step back. So that's when we thought that we shouldn't be a kind of a solo product uh, focused company uh, with all the attendant concentration risk, so we should really diversify. And since I used to work in Cholamandalam Finance, you know, for a long time, 20 odd years, mm -hmm. and I was uh, the one who started vehicle finance in Chola somewhere in 91. Uh, so the first thought of diversification automatically was commercial vehicle, vehicle finance. finance. Yeah, yeah. So in 2011, we launched our commercial vehicle finance. And in 2012, we did a survey amongst our microfinance customers. And we figured out that approximately 15% of the MFI borrowers actually have a business where they have been able to scale up. Right. But having scaled up, they are not able to get the next level of funding from the bank. The okay. microfinance is okay only to come uh, for the initial scale up. After that, when they want to scale further, they need a bigger loan mm. and banks are really not available for them to do that kind of lending for whatever reasons. Then we thought, uh, why not we fill that gap? So we introduced our what we call internally as our micro lab, micro loan against property uh, for the small businesses who are able to scale from beyond the microfinance to a real uh, retail business. Okay. Uh, so we introduced that micro lap in 2012, and mm. that's how our journey continued. And today, microfinance contributes about 18% of the book, while 38% is our small business loan, 25% is uh, commercial vehicles, and about 10-11% is our affordable housing. Okay. Has that premise stayed on as a bank as well, that you want to tap that customer base that is getting out of the microfinance space, but uh, you know, maybe entering the SME uh, sort of uh, business. Is, is, that, is that the customer business that you're targeting? That's right. So uh, there's a lot of data out in the market, uh, data contributed by NSSO, mm. uh, the National uh, Survey Organization, as well as IFC mm. and Crucial. There's a lot of data available in the Indian uh, you know, market. As per those data, uh, there are about uh, 55 million small businesses in the country. Mm. Out of 55 or 60 million small business houses, approximately 45 million of them own a house property. Mm. Uh, and out of that, about 1 million people have actually been able to avail a loan. Okay. Okay, so that leaves about 44 million households uh, who are running some small businesses who also have a house property. It's not like it's got to be an unsecured loan for them. They do own a house property, and yet they are not able to avail a loan from any of the organized players. Uh, so that's a kind of demand gap that we are looking at. And if you translate that into an amount, you're really talking of something like about 25 lakh crores oh. of uh, unmet credit demand Correct. from small business people and who have a house property mm. to even give as a collateral. Mm. Uh, so the, the, the segment that we identified in 2012, I mean, that's a large segment. And so we have actually mm. been building our strengths on that. 
today about 15,000 crore of our loan is from that small business uh, segment. Um, but the but the unmet demand is like huge. Why, why do you think the banks have not tapped into this? Because it clearly it looks like a great business opportunity. Um, see, um, it, it, you, it, it's got to be in your DNA. Mm. It's very difficult to do this business if it's not in your DNA. Okay. Because I'll just give you a very quick example of what actually happens on the field. Let's say there's a restaurant. You know, a restaurant is like typically a small eatery which you see on the, uh, on, yeah. the, on, the, on the streets. A small eatery with maybe five, ten tables uh, and chairs around that. Uh, let's say he wants a loan. Uh, he has no IT returns, he has never filed IT returns. Mm. If you take his bank statement, hardly there will be much of a transaction in the bank statement. So there is no way that you can sit in the office and do a credit appraisal of that person. Yeah. And he has never borrowed from the formal sector, so there is no credit bureau report either uh, for that customer. So he wants a loan of let's say 5 lakhs or 7 lakhs or something like that. So what happens is our credit officer actually sits in that shop two hours, three times in a day and then uh, notes down the footfalls and notes on the turnover that happens okay. during that day and then we extrapolate it to a month. Uh, having extrapolated a month, it's only a best guess. It's not a real number, right. it's just a best guess. So we need to validate this. So the credit officer goes to all the vendors to that restaurant. Uh, for example, in many of the small eateries, they serve the food in a plate on a plantain leaf. Yes. They put a leaf on the plate and then serve the food. So we go to the plantain leaf vendor. We ask him how many leaves does he supply on a okay. daily basis to this uh, restaurant. And then, you know, based on our experience now, we know that for typically this level of turnover, how many gas cylinders he will need per yeah. day. So we go to the cylinder company and ask them how many he delivers. Then we go to the provision uh, suppliers and ask them how, how much of uh, provision that they supply. So we do a lot of vendor verification. And then kind of uh, massage our uh, extrapolation and find out what's the most likely monthly turnover that he has got. The customer himself doesn't actually know. Okay. <laughs> we have to find it out. Okay. And then we sit with him and do all his expense uh, calculation to figure out what's the net profit that he makes. And then he removed half of it for his personal expense. And then we have to impute some informal borrowing. It's it's a given in the segment that they yeah, always have informal, informal borrowing. borrowing. Yeah. So we have to impute some informal borrowing. The customer generally says, no, I have no borrowings. But you know that there's always right. some borrowing. So we remove some amount of EMI for the informal borrowing. And then you are left with some amount of uh, profit uh, balance. Using that as a fire, then we backward to see what's the level of loan that he could ideally be able to take yeah. and service. Yeah. So that's how we do it. It's very complicated and uh, not easy to do it at all. But and, also time consuming, I'm assuming. Uh, definitely time consuming. In fact, when we started this, we used to take almost 10 days to do a process per customer. Okay. But now we have prepared a lot of templates. We've got some system models created for nearly 35 odd businesses. Hmm. We have created a template. So if I go to a provision store today, if my boy, somebody, somebody who joins my bank knew and uh, just about uh, you know basic trained person, hmm. if he goes to a provision store, hmm. he doesn't have to do exactly what my guy did 12 years Correct. back. Correct. Because I have a model for a provision yeah, store today. Ready. So if mm. he just uh, says, what's the size of the provision store? It's 10 by 10. If he puts 10 by 10, immediately my model will say, what's the most likely turnover he'll have? What's the most likely FMCG turnover mm. he'll have? What's the most likely grocery turnover he'll have? And so it'll, it'll just give him lots of information. Now he has to only validate that information. In the, he doesn't have to find the, uh, the, the data per, per se. So because of all that, from a 10 day, now we are in a position to do it anywhere around two to three days. Okay. And it costs. There's a lot of cost that is incurred in, involved in this process, which needs to be you know, added to the uh, lending rates. I want to uh, tap into a little bit about the ecosystem that you're uh, functioning in at this stage, right? So uh, alongside you, there were nine other uh, small finance banks that came in. Most of them were players in the microfinance space, and then uh, you know you and maybe a couple of others uh, were non-microfinance uh, focused entities. Uh, how do you think this differentiated uh, banking uh, sort of uh, scheme that the RBI came up with, how has that panned out? Do you think that it's it's more or less a success, or do you think maybe because I think your cousins of the payments bank side have not done that well? Uh, how do you uh, rate that? 
So if you see the guidelines of Small Finance Bank, the preamble says that this uh, differentiated license is being given basically to promote financial inclusion Correct. for the small SMEs and low income uh, you know, customers. So that's the premise for which the, on which the licenses have been given. Mm. And uh, to ensure that the SOB stay true to the purpose of uh, the differentiated yeah. license, we have a 75% private sector yes. target compared to a 40% target for the universal banks. Another thing is that we have another norm, which is that at least 50% of our loan should be less than 25 lakh rupees. Right. So that again, regulatorily, you are forced to go and look at the small borrowers, mm. you know, to promote the inclusion at the bottom of the pyramid. So that's the premise and that's the purpose for which the entire SOB model has been created by RBA Correct. and the government of India. Um, I think it's really panned out very well and uh, there was a meeting in 2019, uh, one of the press meets after the monetary policy where mm. the governor also mentioned in the press meet that you know the RBA is generally happy with the way the SOBs have actually been yeah. able to perform and deliver to yeah. the, uh, the objectives of uh, the license. Correct. And um, you know with the 75% uh, priority sector target might look a little bit uh, onerous uh, when you look at only 40% for the other banks. But the reality is that practically none of us have actually ever bought PSL from other banks to meet our requirements. <laughs> On the other hand, most of us are able to sell our excess PSL to other banks after meeting our 75% requirement. So I think definitely the, uh, the purpose of uh, SOB has been significantly you know, achieved, I would say, mm. except that there is one writer to that, which is that this 10 of us or 12 of us or who are there today or 11 of us who are there today, all put together, um, we are about 1.5% of the system, system. bank yeah. credit. Yeah. Um, well, that may be okay to start with, uh, but out of the 25,000 crore unmet demand I mentioned about the small business loans, and another there's approximately about 15, 18 lakh crores of affordable housing, which is also another uh, unmet demand. Yeah. And um, so if you look at the overall unmet demand from the informal economy borrowers of the country, you are really looking at about 45, 50 lakh crores. That's the total size. And all SFBs put together, we might be about 2 lakh crores. Okay. So 2 lakh against maybe a potential 50 lakh crore, that's a gap. So one is that we have a long way to go to really try and uh, meet the uh, financial inclusion yeah. in a meaningful manner. And second is that maybe more players are required. Maybe this 8, 10 of us, 11 of us, maybe it take enough. just too long. Mm. Mm. You mentioned COVID earlier. Now let me uh, tackle that. The kind of customer base that SFPs, uh, including yourself, uh, tackle, uh, they tend to be at the receiving end of a lot of uh, what COVID brought forth, right? Uh, businesses were shut down for months on end. Loss of life, loss of income, loss of uh, business. All of that happened. Um, you saw mass migration happening in some cities as well. Uh, you know, people who were working at the lower end of the employment bucket were, were choosing to go back to their hometowns because there was just no point staying there in the cities. Um, how did you, as a lender, see that, tackle that? How did you, how did that pan out? Yeah. <clears throat> So the first time the lockdown was announced by the Prime Minister, somewhere in the, uh, I think, uh, towards the end of March 2020, yeah. for uh, 45 days um, or something like that, yeah. uh, maybe 30 days, I'm not able to recollect. Sure. So the first lockdown which was announced was like dramatic. I mean, none of us in our lifetime have ever, ever experienced a lockdown, of ever. Course. So it was like, uh, it was completely dramatic to all of us. Hmm. and. Um, then it went on and on after that. Um, so uh, when RBA came with the moratorium uh, to give it to the customers who are not able to pay for a six month holiday period, mm -hmm. and they can then pay it at the end of the end con of period, contract yeah. along yeah. with uh, additional interest for the delay. Uh, when RBA came out with that, uh, most of I mean, all the banks naturally offered that to the clients. And um, I can give you some data because this is in public space, sure. because this all mentioned by various people in various public forums. So State Bank of India had a moratorium of around 15%. Mm. And HDFC Bank had a moratorium of around 9, 9.5%. Nine I'm quoting those numbers because they are in public space, Correct. right? I just heard it on TV or uh, whatever channels. Sure. Um, so guess what's the percentage of customers who avail moratorium in Equitas? Just give me a guess. 
Five, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. You tell me. Ninety-eight percent of customers oh. by number oh. and ninety percent by value, value avail the moratorium. Ninety oh. percent by value. My God. <laughs> right. Avail the moratorium. The reason is very simple. As you mentioned, the low-income people who are all sitting in urban areas, who, who are not able to find any livelihood, no source of income, the minimum they can do is at least save expenses by moving back to their village. Okay. So they all went away to their village, and there's no income for them to pay. And uh, the small businesses that we finance, uh, their shops are shut, there's nobody passing by on the road to do any yeah. purchase. Yeah. Where is this income? It's the income from whatever level becomes zero uh, within a day because of the lockdown. So they are not in a position to pay. So 90% by value and 98% by number of customers have the moratorium in Equitas. Um, but a lot of people told me that, you know, this is very dangerous and this can potentially kind of break the bank Correct. and all that. Correct. But I, mean, I, would, are, I would have said the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> but we were actually never really worried at okay. any point and we were never worried because we know our customers. We know that the days the, the cash flow and livelihood starts coming back, they'll just come back and pay. So our NPA during this period went up from 2.5% to 4.5%. That was the peak NPA that we went. Hmm. And then within two years that NPA has come back to 2 and our person levels yeah. and uh, we never made a loss either our lowest roa we went down to during covid was 1.1% okay um, so i think it was a tough time it was definitely very difficult time that we experienced and went through uh, but at the end of it uh, our customers have bailed us out <laughs> okay we're running uh, short on the time on the show but i want to ask one question for sure uh, which is on the liabilities front. Now, for a lender of your uh, pedigree, right, uh, somebody who has been an NBFC, became a bank, uh, the job of collecting the deposits was, was a challenging one, I'm sure. Uh, but you're one of the few lenders who's offering a higher uh, savings account rate, 7% you're offering to your customers. Um, I'm assuming on the fixed deposit rate as well, that's quite high. Q1, uh, Equita Small France Bank, just for our viewers' uh, reference, Q1 of uh, FI25, you've seen a 35% year-on-year growth. Yes, the base is small, it's about 37,000 crore roughly. Uh, having said that, you're still growing on CASA, CASA ratio not so much, but CASA absolute numbers, you are growing. Fixed deposits, of course, you're growing. How are you getting these numbers and, and what has differentiated Equitas from the rest of the pack where people are actually seeing margin con uh, or uh, CASA contraction? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, liability, you know, uh, when we started as a bank 2016, uh, we were wondering whether people will really place their money with us because mm. nobody would have heard of us. Equitas was not a well known brand, and we are not going to be having enough money to promote it as a brand either. Correct. And, you know, banking is all about trust, and trust doesn't happen overnight. Uh, trust happens over a long period of time. You see a branch somewhere in your neighborhood and you keep passing by for a few months or a few years and the branch continues to be there. Then slowly the trust comes up. Oh, this branch is there, so maybe this bank is okay. Yeah. Right? It takes time to build the trust. Yeah. So we are wondering whether we will actually be able to get uh, um, deposits. Because as a bank, I can't borrow from another bank. That's not Correct. allowed. Uh, so my only source was to be deposits. Uh, but uh, but in reality, we never struggled from the day one. We never struggled on raising money. And I think a, a large part of that credit, I have to give it to RBI. Uh, because RBI, through their own various prudential management of the banking system, yeah. they have ensured a zero bank default in the country for all these decades. Zero default. Not even once has a depositor lost money, even one rupee in a banking mm. uh, company. Mm. So I think that is what really finally helped us because the the day we put the bank in our name, immediately people said, okay, this is a bank, so nothing too bad can go wrong. So the, the trust value came up because of the word bank in the name. Um, so we were always reasonably okay on deposit mobilization. Today, of course, as you mentioned, the liquidity is tight and the demand for deposit from all the banks is very high. And so it's a real struggle for raising money. There's no doubt on that. Uh, as you mentioned, we do pay 7% at some slabs for savings interest rate. And on term deposit, 
that we pay our peak is eight and a half percent okay. compared to seven point two five percent, which is the peak for most of the large most banks. The so I'm again I am about a one one quarter percent higher than the large banks. Yeah. So there is that 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 one thing which is always we dangle in front of a depository in terms of interest rate, yeah. which is which is a reality. Uh, and over time, as I mentioned, over the next three to five years, we should be shortening that gap okay. uh, to help us uh, improve our cost of funds. Uh, second thing is that we do a lot of uh, brand promotion. And when I say brand, I don't mean national brand sure. uh, building, but I'm saying at a local catchment area. So every month, we do nearly about uh, 800, 900 events across our 400 odd liability brands. Every month. Every month. And we are reaching out to approximately 75, 80,000 new people in that two, three kilometer catchment area, telling them that there is a branch of a bank, you know, just around the corner for you. We do have an attractive interest rate, but mm. also at the same time, we do give a good service. And we are also in a position to offer a relationship manager to you at a value lower than what maybe other large banks offer. And so there can be a better personalized service for you in, in a branch very close to you. So approximately 75, 80,000 new people get to know about a branch in their local community and I think this over long period that we have been doing has helped us to improve the awareness and brand recall within that two three kilometer catchment area of every liability branch so I think that brand uh, awareness right. and our interest rates I think combination touch wood uh, we are very comfortable on deposits all right uh, Mr. Vasivan that's the time we have uh, for the show I mean I, I know there were a bunch of questions that we were discussing a little earlier before this interview but uh, uh, maybe another interview in the near term that way we can discuss those points as well. Thank you so much for coming down uh, to our studios and taking time out from your busy schedule talking to us, sir. Sure. Thank you. So thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, viewers, uh, that was Bankable. Do stay tuned for more news and updates on NDP Profit.